Well, hello and welcome again to our devotions at uh, Christ Baptist Church. Uh, while we're still not able to meet together as uh, an assembly, but we're locked down with uh, the coronavirus, but we are our homes and we come to you with a devotion every day. We've been talking about growing in Christ, how to grow as a Christian. And in this series that we've been walking through this week, uh, we've added to what we knew about growing as a Christian, which is knowing the gospel and knowing what that is. And went through the book of Romans and picked some verses to show you how one is actually made a new creature. It, it, it isn't someone that believes something different. It's someone that's actually turned into somebody different because God did that. And that's what the message of the gospel is. But once someone becomes changed into a new creature, they're, they're like a, a newborn baby. They're, they're, they're like a spiritual baby. And they need to grow. And so how do they grow? And the first steps that we learn is before you learn to grow, uh, like living in Africa is dangerous. The lions are ready to take every newborn baby of an animal that's coming out so they can have their dinner. We understand our enemies. Our enemies are the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We talked about all three of those in the last three devotions, about how they're after our souls. They're after taking us and separating us from our faith to prove to us that our faith was never genuine by making it difficult. And so we learned about that. And, and the, the solution, the, the, the remedy that we have is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is how you grow by knowing God's word because Satan is a liar. He's a father of lies. And everything is about a lie. The thing you should fear most is believing lies because it's your sin that can accuse you. When you die and you go meet God, when your sin accuses you and, and you've been believing a lie, that's the most perilous place you can be. You see, it's not what you did or didn't do here on the earth that you invested in that's going to make a difference. It's your sins, will they be able to accuse you and will the accusation stick? Because that's what's going to happen. The accuser will stand before every believer saying, yes, but. And will those sins stick? Or will you have a union with Christ who has paid for those sins? And in every case, your advocate, your lawyer, your attorney will say, no, 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 we've got that covered. That's been paid for. And there are no sins anywhere that stick. That's the most important thing that can happen. Now, as you grow in Christ... We sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So we have to know God's word. Now, unless you were raised with the Bible and know the Bible, it's a, it's a pretty formidable book. We learned yesterday that though if we give about 15 minutes a day, we can get through it in a year. That's a pretty good task. But I just want to give you some clues, some hints, some things to maybe inspire you to jump into God's word. And, and how to take it, because you start in one place and it's easy to get lost in the detail. But I will say this, the Bible is, is divided in two sections, the, what's called the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is written largely in pictures, meaning it's narrative, it's stories. It's not, not, it's not someone giving you a bunch of commands. It, it's stories, it's, it's like watching a movie take place. Now, why would God do that? Because the New Testament, it starts off that way with Jesus and the Gospels, and that's a storyline, and the book of Acts is a storyline. But then it moves into letters, letters that are instructions. And, and we have to understand legal language and all kinds of things like that. Now, there's a reason for that. And God gave us pictures in the Old Testament because people weren't educated formally, like learning how to read and written language and those kind of things. But how they will remember is you sit around a campfire and you talk about what's going on and you, and you tell these stories as they are recounted about what God did and they're remembered by far. We write that one story down and everybody remembers it. Nobody forgets. And you get to the New Testament, in the Greek world, when it's all about education and advancement and, and society's advancing, now it's about structure and language and instruction and make sure that we're understanding the argument clearly. So that's the New Testament. 
and, and before I give you a couple of pointers, I'll just give you a little story. When my wife and I got saved, and one of the things she said that really kind of stopped her all along from actually truly believing, she said, if John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. That verse, which believing would not perish and have eternal life, if that's so important, why didn't God put that in the very first verse of the Bible and let everything else come after it? Why didn't he make it so easy to find? If it's that important, well, from a human standpoint, it's an obvious question. But when you're God and you're providing this to people, you realize, no, there, there's something much bigger here because John 3.16 is a promise fulfilled that was explained all in the Old Testament. You miss all about God in the Old Testament. You see, we need to, we need to learn about God. Jesus died to bring us to God. That's what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us Jesus died in order to bring us to God so that we could get to God and know who God is. Well, we go run to John 3, 16. We don't know who God is. The Jews were raised with the scriptures because they felt it very important. They were commanded by God, very important. You teach your children from the beginning to know who I am. Because when we know who he is, then we know how to please him. And we know how to have joy in our lives and what kind of God he is that we serve. So we want to know the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament, as I said, it's a, it's a group of stories that we read history. The Bible is believable because it's rooted in history, not because it's rooted in a guy's dream. The Book of Mormon, the Mormons, it was all created because somebody had a dream. Somebody stepped behind a curtain and got a revelation. The Quran is, Muhammad had some revelations and he wrote some things down. The Bible is written history of a particular place, and it begins with the history of the world as it starts, and it goes on and it tracks the history in the Middle East, and eventually a country called Israel that, that, that moved on and and all the countries that surround them are part of that. And it's about history that is believable because archaeology eventually proves it true. You see, it's objective truth. It's not subjective. It's not somebody's idea. Archaeology always proves it true. We've been through the book of Daniel. And, and for years and centuries, no one believed in Daniel chapter 5 that Belshazzar the king that was having the banquet there in the, in the hall, in the big hall, they thought he was the actual king of Babylon. But actually, his father was a man named Nabonidus. Well, they didn't believe Nabonidus actually existed. They just believed Belshazzar then. And nobody could figure out why he wanted to grant Daniel to be the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Until, you know, a century ago or however long it was ago, Archaeologists found something called the, Nebol the Nabonidus Cylinder written and described who Nabonidus was and that he was fighting this battle outside. And archaeologically, we prove now that the king of Babylon was actually outside fighting the battle when Belshazzar was inside, matching the third highest ruler in the kingdom. See, archaeology proves the Bible true. It's really cool. It's amazing. And so we read the Bible as a history book. Now, with that, when you open your Bible and you go to Genesis chapter 1 and, and you see the, the beginning words and you see Genesis chapter 1 and we start and say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Earth was formless and void and God saw, He created light, let there be light and then He created evening and morning and He goes on and we see these things and you say, well that's not what science says. Well, of course not. This is supernatural. This isn't natural. God is not bound by natural. God gave us the scientific method. But if you were God and you're going to introduce the world, would you do it in a natural way? But you're God, you're supernatural. So we get a supernatural entrance. I would expect that if I'm if the Bible is about God, I expect God-like things to happen. 
And so I, it doesn't surprise me. So when you read the Bible, you have to read the Bible with an expectation that I expect God to be God in the Bible, not to be like what I think the world tells me God is like. No. God is he's majestic. He's surprising. He, he, he's amazing because getting to know this God tells us this is a God who is just. This is a God who is merciful. This is a God who has love. This is a God who cares for us, and this is a God who also knows us very well. There's a, just a couple of interesting stories, just pictures I want to give to you, to interest you, to say, I, know, I want to learn about this. And we have lots of books to get going and teach you about how the history goes. But in Israel's history, there was a, a king named Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king. He was very, very wicked. He married a, a very bad woman. And then they, they hated God. They wanted to go worship idols. And this Ahab, he conspired to steal a man's vineyard. And, and his wife had him killed, had, had this man killed so that his, her husband could take his vineyard, which he did. Well, God spoke to this man through a prophet. And he just said, you are going to die. In 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 21, he says, Behold, I'll bring evil upon you, and I'll utterly sweep you away. We'll cut off from Ahab every male, both bond and free in Israel. We're done. You, you, have, you have gone past the limit, buddy. And he describes how he is going to kill him. He's, gonna, he's not going to bring his death. Well, verse 27, it came about when Ahab heard these words, that he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted, and he lay in sackcloth, and went about despondently. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but I'll bring the evil upon his house in his son's days. Just because Ahab reacted to God's words, God said, Oh, did you see that? I'm so impressed. Now his readers... We read that history, we say, well, hey, that's unfair. That's unfair. You can't do that, God. That, that, that's like a, a horrible twist in a movie plot. Now, this man is wicked. He has done some wicked things. He deserves to die. And God is all of a sudden letting him off the hook? You can't do that. What does that tell us about God? This is a God of grace. This is a God who says, I, I listen and I wait for that one turn of repentance, that one turn to, to turn and understand. Because Ahab didn't just turn because of some random event. He turned because of what God's word said. We don't like that because we think Ahab deserves to get it. Well, we keep reading the story. Yeah, Ahab turned at that time and God said, I'm going to delay it a little bit. What does God do? Well, Ahab is still now creating nonsense. He doesn't change really permanently. And he goes off to, to go to war with some other people. In the middle of the battle, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 34, in the middle of this battle, you get one of these little verses that just comes out of nowhere. Now a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in a joint of the armor. So he said to his driver of the chariot, turn around and take me out of the fight for I'm severely wounded. And he died in the chariot that day, exactly in the spot where God said he would. A man draws his bow at random, just kind of like you're fighting, he just decides to point over here and ping, there goes the arrow out of, out of the middle of nowhere. And off it goes and it hits the king in the one spot where he's going to get killed, where the armor doesn't touch each other and boom, there goes the arrow. That's a God of precision. That's a God who says, but I am just and I will judge you as I said I would. I gave you a chance and now I'm going to do this. Boy, what a picture of God just right there in, in a couple of pages in the Bible about what he's doing with King Ahab. He blows us away with his grace, blows us away with his mercy, and he blows us away with his judgment and how severe it is, and it comes swiftly at a time when we don't know because he controls even the random guys with the bows. You see, that's what we need to know about in the Bible. We need to know who God really is because the world is trying to tell us who God is and turn him into something we put on holiday cards. Well, that's not going to change lives. 
the God of the Bible is going to change lives. I just want to give you one more thing. God is a God who also does not promise to tell you the future. He does not promise to tell you the future at all. God's not, he, he, he's not looking to, to tell you because he wants you to walk by faith. He, he, he's looking to have you understand who he is so that he will have you walk every day waiting for him to bless and walking in obedience. That's what he does. So, in the book of Leviticus, we see here in Leviticus chapter, I think it's 24, 25, basically, God tells the people, you're going you're gonna to be tough. It's a tough land. You're going to come in, you're going to farm. And what I need you to do, right here, chapter 25, verse 3 of Leviticus, he says, six years I want you to sow your field, six years you're going to take your vineyard, gather this crop. But in the seventh year, the land will have a Sabbath rest. In other words, you don't farm. No farming on the seventh year. None. Whatsoever. Now, your harvest after growth, you shall not reap. Your grapes, untrimmed vines, don't gather. You let it rest. See, God's a God who understands farming. He says, you don't just tear the ground up till you can't farm anymore. All of you shall have the sabbatical products of the land for food. Everybody's going to have that. Now, you do this, and basically what's going to happen is, you're going to say, well, how do I eat on the seventh year? How do I do this? And if you say... Because you're, you're doing this and you're, and, you're, and you're holding off. But if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops? He says in verse 20. What are, what are we going to eat in the seventh year? We're not farming now. Then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that I will bring forth the crop for three years. Your sixth year, every sixth year, out of every seven years, on the sixth year, your crop will give 300% increase. Your crop will give three years worth of food and you'll be able to store it. He says, Then I will sow order my blessing for you in the sixth year to bring forth the crop for three years. And when you're sowing the eighth year, you can still eat the old things from the crop, eating the old till the ninth year when its crop comes in. God said, I'm going to do this every sixth year. This meant Israel knew the future. They knew the future about farming. They knew every sixth year it's going to be 300%. They knew that. God told them what was going to happen. And you know what they did? They completely disobeyed God, did not receive the blessing, because from about the days of Joshua, they did not hold off that seventh year. They were so greedy they said, we'll get three times the amount of the sixth year and we'll farm the seventh year and we'll get an extra crop as well. And they did that for 490 years until God said, enough. And he put them in Babylon for 70 years. You see, God knows that when he tells us the future, and it's going to be a blessing in the future, what are we going to do? We're going to ignore the blessing and take more than what he said and we're going to try to control the future. So he doesn't tell us the future, ever. He doesn't tell us. He tells us promises that are going to happen, but he doesn't tell us something we can count on for ourselves because he knows us. He knows what we'll do. We have an example for it right here in Israel. They did that. And they took that away. That's why the, uh, you go to the book of Deuteronomy, a long Old Testament book, 29 verse 29. What does it tell us? The secret things belong to the Lord. Our God is a mystery. And God has secrets. The secret things belong to Him, not for us. But the things we are knowing, the things we're knowing to do, we're to do them. It's very clear. It's a very simple book. So this is a book to get to know somebody. 
I, I like to tell people as you're sitting in with an interview with God and, and you'd like to interview God and he hands you his CV. This is God's CV right here. He shows up at the door. You're, you're a big boss looking for a God and he shows up at the door and he hands you a CV. You take it and you read the CV about who God is and as you get done reading it you realize wait a minute I'm not the boss he is <laughs> and he was kind enough to give it to me and let me read it and figure it out for myself that's our God and if we can understand who our God is through scripture as Satan's lies come to us as the world comes to us as the flesh comes to us we now have the truth of who God is to be armed and say, do not test the Lord your God with conviction because we know him, because we've walked with him. So this is a small little encouragement for you to say, I can do this. I can read the Bible 15 minutes a day. I can understand. Some parts of it are deep water. Some parts of it are shallow. That's okay. But a dose every day gets you to meet your God and know who he is. That will arm us for these enemies that we've talked about. So that'll help us for today. Now, just to tell you before we sign off, where we're going to go next week, well, we've gone through the book of Daniel. I know we've done First and Second Thessalonians and Jonah, but we have done the book of Daniel. So I'm going to look next week to see if we can't jump into the book of Esther. Esther. It's a great devotional book. It's actually the only book of the Bible where God, the name of God, is never mentioned in the entire book. God's not mentioned. It's like he's not there. But as you read the story, you find God is everywhere in the book. The book of Esther. As you read, begin reading the first chapter, let me just tell you where Esther is found. I mean, it's found in the Old Testament, but we know the book of Daniel, and we talked about the time when Daniel was taken captive, and then Daniel got old, he was in his 80s, about 530 some odd BC. Esther happens when the Medes and the Persians took over, and they took over Daniel, and they ruled now for some time. During one of those king's rules, Artaxerxes, we see Esther, a Jew who is dispersed out, and her cousin Mordecai feature in this amazing book as we look at Daniel, Esther, and we'll look at these books of the Bible that happened after the, the Israel returned back from Babylon. So join us next week when we start in the book of Esther, and I hope you get excited to, to look and meet your God in reading the Bible. Thank you.